All right, welcome back to Problem Solver Politics. Uh, we've got a very important podcast prepared for you guys today. There is a new formula for free speech fascism in America, and it's very dangerous, and anybody listening to this podcast is vulnerable. Here at Problem Solver Politics, we are not fear mongers. We love America. We want everybody to live peaceful lives, but we also believe in standing up while you still can to the encroachments on our civil liberties. But this one is not an encroachment and it's very dangerous, okay? There's a new formula in the left that literally has just formulated this week for not just silencing, but endangering the lives of anybody that does not agree with the technocracy or does not agree with right now what the modern left is putting out there. Um, first, we're gonna talk about the old formula and now we're going to talk about the new formula and also why this is important. The reason why this is important is first we're going to go and we're going to talk about a poem written by uh, a pastor, actually, a German Lutheran pastor named Martin Neumüller. I don't even know how to say his name, okay, about the cowardice of German intellectuals during the rise of the Nazi power. It's, it's, it's very well known. It's in the Holocaust Memorial. The best known version of this speech is an edited version that says, in the Holocaust Memorial, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. They came, then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. What this German Luther, L Lutheran pastor Martin N., we'll call him, was talking about is happening right now, but online and in the banning of conservatives or really just anti-establishment people in general. And there used to be a formula for this, okay? The old formula that generally our public trusted, okay, was we all operated in our lives and these groups like the ACLU or the Southern Poverty Law Center were watchdog groups that kept their eye out on things, okay, making sure that hate groups didn't become too powerful. And if they did become powerful, the ACLU would represent for free the people that they were persecuting, and the Southern Poverty Law Center would register these groups and these people as hate groups so we could all avoid them. However, it then got profitable. And just as Bernie Sanders said, that our criminal internment organizations should not be profitable or else they will incentivize putting people in jail. We cannot make profitable calling somebody a hate group or you will incentivize classifying them as haters. And unfortunately, that's what happened. The old formula for silencing somebody, if you were a leftist in America, was to literally get them on the Southern Poverty Law Center's watch list. And then all kinds of great things could happen. You could deplatform them from social media platforms by calling them a hate group. You could invoke hate speech laws in uh, certain municipalities or certain organizations. Uh, in the best of ways, you could get them kicked off Patreon. You could get them kicked off their MasterCard transfers. You could actually get them kicked out of Chase Bank. Here you can see the actual list, okay, of hate groups as the Southern Poverty Law Center declares them all as hate groups. And unfortunately, once you got them on that list, all of a sudden, man, you couldn't put them in jail like Mussolini did. You couldn't send them to Siberia and jail their families like Joseph Stalin did, but you could make it so they could not have a bank account, so they couldn't engage in financial transactions, basically freezing their lives and not allowing them to participate in society. And it did happen. There are hundreds of conservatives now just in the past couple of years who've lost everything from access to their PayPal, like Laura Loomer. There was Joe Biggs, who's a combat veteran um, who lost his Chase bank account. Cody, help me out here. Just off the top of our heads, how many conservatives have been deplatformed or have lost their ability to engage in financial transactions just because of the Southern Poverty Law Center? Um, well, it's, like I said, it's tough to say conservatives because a lot of these people a lot of times dispute kind of where they sit on that, uh, on that scale. However, I mean, one of the ones that I go to, love him or hate him, he's a very controversial figure. Uh, the bottom line is Alex Jones runs a very popular radio show that has been removed from basically every platform there. There's also 
a lot of famous accounts, not just of uh, this man right here, Joe Biggs, but there's been multiple other times, uh, specifically Proud Boys members have uh, had their bank shut down on them. Uh, there was a woman, I can't remember her name, she's I believe a tech reporter, mostly on the right. Same thing, Chase Bank sent her a memo and just said, look, we're not there interested. There was the girl that was selling the Make America Great Again and New York City Loves Donald Trump t-shirts in New York City that got deplatformed. And here in Los Angeles, we have some acquaintances that we know that were deplatformed. Uh, there was Joe Messina, the radio host. I mean, just a regular radio host. There was Dave Goss. All these people get deplatformed, okay? And it almost never happens to the leftist. It, unless it, it does, though, at times. I mean, it, well, if you Proportionally? If you, come on. One, but I would say proportionally, though, you're, you're dealing with less anti-establishment people on the left because... Today, the left is, I mean, the left's even a tricky word for it, but more or less, the media establishment leans particularly in the more kind of liberal left way. So people who have those similar beliefs are going to be coming out against the establishment okay. less than, you know, sovereign citizen libertarian types. Okay. We always talk about things adversely and disproportionately affecting certain communities. I believe it's fair to say that this phenomenon adversely and disproportionately affects conservatives and it's obvious it does and the old form formula for leftists to be able to shut down the speech of people on the right was to get them on the southern poverty law center's hate group list and then they would end up going after all their platforms and all of their financial organizations okay it happened to sargon of Akkad at patreon he was no longer allowed to actually do any kind of financial transactions on patreon either now fortunately for all of america the Southern Poverty Law Center basically just went down in flames. Okay? Is it fair to say? Catch us up on what happened to the Southern Poverty Law Center, Cody. Um, well, the SPLC has been in the news. I believe there was a man. I want to pull up the story to get everything right. Uh, he's the, he was the president. Yeah, he was the president. Um, well, the president and the co-finder. So basically, the I'll bring the story up right here. It's from our, our friends over at CNN. Um, but basically, the co-founder of the SPLC was outed for kind of being um, horrible person to work with slash horrible person in general, sexist, <laughs> racist. I mean, well, a lot of the stuff, it's really hard to tell. But I mean, a lot of people have said that former employees have came out and said, like, look, it, it was uncomfortable working here. We all kind of are idealists and believed in what we were doing, but it wasn't like it was obvious things were wrong. Um, as kind of the fallout of it, the uh, president has resigned after the firing of the co-founder. So you have two of the, you know, kind of front facing people of this company, of this big, massive uh, lobbying group that basically are backed out because they were enabling or yeah. actively engaging in uh, racism and sexism. Yeah. So basically the Southern Poverty Law Center is outed as being an absolutely hypocritical organization that violates the very ideals it claims to espouse. Only after, for the past decade, it has ruined literally hundreds of thousands of people's lives by systematically listing them as something they weren't, just like the Third Reich systematically listed people that they didn't agree with that were political undesirables, okay, in preparation for their overthrow of basically all of Western Europe, okay? And now, now that Southern Poverty Law Center has gone down in flames, okay? A new organization with a new formula that's even more vicious has stepped up to fill its place. And guess who it is? None other than Media Matters, the single most fascist and leftist organization out there that I can think of right now. I don't know. Cody, can you think of one? Um, well, I mean, it, it's tough because of what Media Matters is. I mean, Media Matters has you know been around probably about 15 years now. And for what they do, they are probably one of the largest ones out there. But I mean, really, all Media Matters is at its kind of core, it's a lobbying firm. It, they just lobby for their particular interests. And, 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 which and, is, and, and whose side do they lobby for? Uh, the mainstream establishment left. That's it. The, the mainstream, the, the establishment, mainstream left. establishment, really. So if you have offended the mainstream establishment, uh, establishment left for doing something in simple... As not agreeing with an adoption policy in a state like the Ruth Institute did, or perhaps thinking that the way we handle terrorist organizations uh, is not proper or aggressive enough like Joe Biggs did, Media Matters is now going to put you on their list, okay? And Facebook now has announced that it is going to ban white nationalism, okay? 
and it actually has a very interesting um actually has a very interesting formula it says it's going to ban white nationalism ethnocentrism right or the quote representation thereof so all you need to do is even talk about it in a way that they don't like you could actually be on their side and just by nature of the fact that you're talking about it and they don't like the way you're talking about it they could ban you this is what's happening to ben shapiro and the new formula is very simple okay if facebook can ban white nationalists how do you prove someone's a white nationalist you only have to have two or three articles written about them questioning whether or not they're a white nationalist and then you have an excuse to actually deplatform them and they're actually trying to do this now as we speak Cody, you put it a very uh, effectively today in our, our our prep for the show. That what did you say about you only have to do it three times and it's in the canon? Uh, well, this is a I can't think I love to take full credit for this, but this has actually been a point that's echoed. I think originally there's a comic, a web comic, XKCD was it? Essentially, the idea is uh, one person can put something out there that's not true. The editorial you can do an opinion piece. Mm-hmm. Someone else can cite your opinion piece and their opinion piece. Then somebody can write a news article citing two opinion pieces and they could say, look, there's been two articles claiming so-and-so is a white supremacist. And then now you have a news article and two opinion pieces claiming something that's factually incorrect and inaccurate. However, it's in the canon now. There's a news article that is citing other news articles about something and it's kind of hard at a certain point to say, you know, well, if this isn't true, why am I finding news articles about this? And a lot of times you kind of dance around what's an editorial, what's an opinion piece, is citing an opinion piece in a news story actually news? Or, you know what I mean? It's You kind of get to these very um, nebulous concepts of what are we actually talking about here and what are actually facts? And you can play with them really easy. And then this is where it gets very scary. Go straight to mediamatters.org. Straight to their website. They proclaim they're doing this. Well, also, I've pulled up right here. They've listed out some of some uh, in, in the wake of Facebook announcing their ban on white supremacists. They they pick some Facebook pages. I think Facebook should look into. And uh, I want to just kind of highlight at the bottom here there's some names that are really interesting. OK, let's look at them. Um, well, one of the ones, uh, Nick Fuentes. Uh, Nick Fuentes has been accused of being a white nationalist many times. He is time and time again categorically denied it. Categorically what, said. What, what does white nationalist now mean? Well, anyway, that's, you like that's the trick. Unless thing. you're self-loathing. Unless you're literally a self-loathing, white, guilt-ridden baby boomer, you're a white nationalist now. And everybody, even I, I, I know Mexicans that have been called white nationalists. We had a black radio, uh, a conservative radio host just called a white nationalist a couple of months ago. Like, everybody and their dog is a white nationalist now, so much so that I don't even know what white nationalism means anymore other than we don't like you. Well, also, like I said, you look at some of the things here, and I, I understand these are fairly controversial um platforms but I, I don't i don't know if i would go out there and say breitbart and tucker carlson tonight are white nationalists i mean wait tucker carlson is actually on the media matters they have tucker carlson they have the the website breitbart um laura ingraham again i wouldn't call her like a white nationalist laura ingram's on there yeah and then you but then because the thing is though they're, they're they're lumping them in with stuff like goy talk the jesse lee peterson show david duke people that i would say probably admittedly would even say they're kind of more white nationalists than anything else or I don't know if white nationalists is the term, but these are people that are definitely more on that fringe extreme. But I mean, Breitbart's just a news organization. I get that they're more conservative than most, but they're just a news organization. Tucker Carlson's, uh, Laura Ingraham, yeah, just the television MSNBC personalities. of the right. That's all they are. Yeah, and, I mean, and you're lumping and them the in right with actual is, neo-Nazi podcasts. It's very bizarre. Yeah, and, and the right's not calling to have the MSNBC people's lives ruined. Well, I mean, platform. They want them off the air. They're, and, they're, they're, they're 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 currently doing the crab dance over the ratings of MSNBC after the Mueller no, report. No, no, but reveling in the success or the the, the demise of ratings because you have defeated in the court of public opinion somebody's ideas by using your free speech is totally different than subversively trying to take them out of the game. It's just like at the end of the Karate Kid. You know, the the coach for Cobra Kai that said, break his leg, okay? We all view that as worse than unsportsmanlike conduct, worse than cheating. It's morally wrong, okay? And that's what the left is trying to do now in their new formula is to just get a couple of opinion articles written about you questioning whether or not you're a white supremacist. And then they can get you deplatformed off of Facebook, off of Twitter, and apparently now MasterCard, Patreon, and and Chase Bank, which control wide swaths of, of, of people's banking. This is the new formula. And this is why it's dangerous. 
Because just as Sinclair Lewis said in his famous poem, when fascism comes to America, it will come draped in the flag and carrying the cross. Forgive me if I botch the quote. But it says it'll be draped in the flag and carrying the cross. Basically, just like in Star Wars, okay, when Queen Amidala says, wow, so this is how liberty dies with roaring applause, okay, we are watching free speech literally being under attack by fascism, okay, to the roaring applause of fighting white nationalism. However, when you make white nationalism a subjective definition, it becomes very dangerous, okay? And the reason why it's so dangerous is because anything can be white nationalist, literally anything. And it's important that we actually view how we treat these people, guys. And here's the reason why it's important. How we treat the crazy flat earthers, how we treat the crazy anti-vaxxers and the people that still think Elvis is alive and the Alex Joneses and the dailystormer.coms out there, how we treat them dictates, literally, they're like the canaries in the coal mine, dictates how we are treating free speech in, gen in general. And it serves us to give them the most free speech and the most latitude possible because, for example, let's take, and, and we'll close with this, the Daily Stormer. The Daily Stormer used to be, I was like, I've never, I've never actually been on it myself, but it's it was the neo-Nazi, probably the most popular, I'd say, neo-Nazi website. Wouldn't you say, Cody? Uh, more or less. It was kind of like, uh, it was like, yeah, the unofficial alt-right before that was a thing website everyone went to. Uh, yeah. So the like one-tenth of one percent of America that is actually white supremacist, all of the Pew research shows that there's actually more people that believe Elvis is still alive than actually believe that whites are superior just for the color of their skin. I believe there's more practicing Jedis in the United States yeah, than there is active uh, white supremacists. Yeah, so for all 20 of those white supremacists that are out there, okay, um, they would go to this site, the Daily Stormer. Um, I saw screenshots of it and different rants that people had uh, against white supremacy. But in, the, in, in a nutshell, there were some podcasts and some blogs, and they could congregate and use all their coded language together. But at the end of the day... We could all watch them in real time, what they were doing, what they were thinking, where their rallies were going to be, where their rock concerts were going to be, so on and so forth. And that way we could kind of mitigate the damage, make sure our children weren't getting involved, make sure, you know, stay out of the park that day if they're going to have a rally, so on and so forth. But after Charlottesville, everybody decided to virtue signal and they tried to get on five or six different servers and five or six different platforms and everybody held their heads up high saying, oh, we don't tolerate here and deplatform them. So guess what they had to do? They had to go to the dark web. Now, the only homegrown domestic terrorist organization out there, which was the Ku Klux Klan, and I'd say the Daily Stormer is probably the only real extension of that ideology that existed in modern times. Well, there's also, there no longer exists, but there was the American Nazi Party, and there are still people that will yeah. cite and read, you know, George Lincoln Rockwell stuff. Oh, yeah, exactly. But basically what I would say is now that ideology, instead of being open source online where we can read it, has been driven underground. So now our children, if they want to be involved in this, are forced to go behind our backs, well, not behind our backs, but forced to go underground on Tor and on VPNs to find this stuff. And which would you prefer as a parent? Which would you prefer as the mayor of a city? Which would you prefer as a congressman of a state that has a small percentage of neo-Nazis? An open source website you can check from your desktop to make sure they're not up to something too crazy? Or would you prefer that they be underground like the mafia was during Prohibition? The only lesson we learn from prohibition is when you outlaw something, you drive it underground. So we now have just given free reign to the literally the 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 regressive left, the fascist left, whatever you want to call it, to call people white nationalists that completely don't deserve it. And if you just can get a couple of opinion articles out there, you can now silence them and deplatform de them and demonetize them completely with zero due process the single biggest violation of one of the most basics of the u.s constitution and the sad thing is we do it to the applause of fighting white nationalism this is problem solver politics
See you next week.